Hi everyone and welcome to another edition of Stay at Home. I'm Bosker Sankara, the editor and publisher of Jacobin, and we're approaching nearly number 50 for these. So uh, we've done far more of them than I initially anticipated. Uh, so thank you all for tuning in. And for those of you just watching for the first time, several times a week, me or another Jacobin host has been joined by a left-wing thinker. Uh, we've been having a discussion about a topic uh, sometimes a popular topic, sometimes a niche topic. This is kind of one that's that's right, you know, in between. Um, and then we've been doing a brief Q and A afterwards. So if you want to participate in that Q and A, all you have to do is log into YouTube, and you could leave comments in the chat, and I'll go through it while our speaker is speaking and compile um, the good ones, and we'll have a conversation uh, after. Um, so obviously we're doing these talks, uh, we're putting a lot of effort into them. Our producer, Kale Brooks, is working very hard to make sure they run smoothly and also that they, so they look nice. So please do press like and subscribe, that's our only ask. It helps us get the video to more people. Uh, we have a great lineup next week. Um, we have on Monday a great conversation with, um, with Mindy Izzer and Paul Prescott on uh, USPS and the battle to stave off privatization, uh, which is, I think, one of the most important things we could be doing uh, now on the left. On Wednesday, we have Jonah Birch, who'll be doing a broader overview of Swedish social democracy and social democracy in general. So what did it accomplish? What legacy it left behind? And why it ultimately um, left us in a bit of an, an impasse, but an impasse where there were important uh, victories and, and victories that, that have actually been preserved. We shouldn't buy into the narrative of complete retrenchment of the welfare state. So in a way, that's kind of like the, the prequel to um, the conversation tonight, but instead we're, we're doing uh, this one first, uh, much like the Star Wars prequels, um, Jonah's will be worse, I think, than, than the one tonight. Just kidding. I think Jonah's watching. Um, on uh, Friday, uh, we are finishing off our week with a, a live event uh, featuring, among others, Amber Frost and Grace Blakely talking about uh, Corbynism and its legacy. So Corbyn, of course, was defeated in December 2019 in the general election. Has Corbynism been defeated too? What's next for the labor uh, left? So. We have a great lineup. Um, please tune in, please press subscribe, press like and all that. And obviously tomorrow and every Saturday we have weekends with Anna Kasparian and Michael Brooks. So today we're joined by Peter Gowan, who's a senior policy associate at the Democracy Collaborative. Uh, he's on the steering committee of Metro DSA and he's a frequent Jacobin contributor. Uh, so he's the author of a recent piece in Jacobin on the uprising in Minneapolis. Uh, he's the author of a great print piece that we made in more optimistic times around 14, 15 months ago came out uh, called A Plan to Win Socialism in America. This still holds up very well, by the way, um, that, that touches on, among other things, wage earner uh, funds and their, their role in the transition to, to socialism. And he's also the author of Revisiting the Minor Plan, or co-author of Revisiting the Minor Plan a piece we published a couple of years back. And I think Peter deserves a lot of credit for the resurgence and kind of looking at the MIDER plan and looking at these other radical attempts within the left wing of social democracy to confront the growing crisis of social democracy that emerged in the 1960s and 70s and solve that crisis in a way that moved us further towards socialism, as opposed to the way the crisis was really resolved um, in actuality, which was a shift towards the right, a kind of third way compromise that said, okay, we'll try to hang on to victories like the NHS, you know, victories like the basics um, of, a, of a welfare state, but we're not gonna attack anything onto the welfare state and we're not going to challenge uh, capital's power. Instead, what we're gonna do is just dial back some of labor's bargaining power and, and hope that capitalists can agree to some sort of new, new bargain. So there was a time, however, in Sweden when there was this possibility of a shift towards 
not just better wages and better conditions in a more expansive welfare state, but workers starting to ask questions of democracy at the point of production. And this was the real radical experiment that started from 67, 68 onward to the mid and late 70s in, in Sweden. And I think this is really important because often when we talk about, especially people on the liberal left, when they talk about neoliberalism, they make it sound like we were perfectly content with our post-war compromise until the capitalists came and they took away the compromise and they didn't play fair. But in many cases, like in Sweden, the post-war compromise started to be broken for the left and for the workers' movement, not from the side of, of, of capitalists. So without further ado, I'm going to pass it off to Peter Gowen. We'll be talking about this fascinating period in the history of Sweden, its relevance for the workers' movement all around the world, and uh, what plans are, are kind of flowing in the direction uh, of the minor plan, or harkening back a little bit to the minor plan uh, today. So thank you uh, for, for joining us today, Peter, and I'll let you take it away for, for around a half an hour or so. Everyone else, please do you know, put your banter, put your questions in the chat, and I will ask uh, Peter your you know, any any questions, no matter how personal, put them in the chat. I'll ask them to Peter after after this uh, his lecture. Okay, uh, thank you so much for that uh, really great and kind introduction, Bhaskar. Uh, I will say uh, I'm an occasional commenter in the sidebar of these things. So yeah, uh, make sure to uh, just leave your questions in the chat. But um, so yeah, uh, I want to talk to people today a little bit about uh, what I think sort of falls into being uh, one of the most ambitious uh, attempts, as Bhaskar said, to uh, move on from the uh, social democratic post-war model into something that is more like a fully socialized uh, economy where workers not only have strong bargaining power, but also have ownership and control collectively of the means of production on a very, very wide scale. Um, so I'm gonna get into a bit of a background beforehand and I apologize if this prefigures some of the stuff that will be covered in the lecture next week, uh, but I think it's important context to discussing the minor plan. But uh, just to give you like a bit of a teaser, um, if the minor plan had been carried out uh, by today, uh, the vast majority of the Swedish economy, certainly all of the most profitable firms and uh, many of the less profitable and pro many, if not most of the less profitable firms would be uh, majority owned by workers and in many cases, almost exclusively owned by workers uh, through uh, union controlled uh, sector wide funds. Um, so I think that it is uh, important just uh, because these terms have a lot of purchase on the American left to say that um, social democracy as it was uh, discussed in Sweden as the sort of social democratic uh, labor party um, or workers party that uh, was the party that Miner was a member of, that uh, Olaf Palme was a member of, uh, that was in government in Sweden pretty much uh, from the, like, for, like from the pre-war period all the way uh, up to the, the mid-1970s, almost uninterrupted, and then again, uh, through the 1980s. Um, social democracy uh, really had a sense, like what was not the ideology that we would think of as social democracy today, where we are talking about people who might ideologically believe in a capitalist economy. They want it to remain there forever, but they want to redistribute the benefits a little better. They might want unions to have a little more power, but ultimately they have no sort of horizon that goes beyond it. Certainly they uh, would no longer consider themselves a Marxist in any real sense. This isn't exactly what social democracy meant at the time. It certainly was by this point had had a pretty decisive break from uh, the official communist movement. And so uh, there was definitely 
the like peaceful uh, road to socialism was something that was totally hegemonic within uh, what was at this point called social democracy. Uh, but there was still a sense that um, like many, if not most people in the Social Democratic Party considered themselves Marxists of some sense or another um, and uh, did have a horizon of a future where uh, workers would not just have influence, would not just have bargaining power, but would also have uh, control over the economy. So this goal was pushed into the future quite significantly in the 1930s, uh, just like in the election uh, just before the Social Democrats first took power. Um, the idea of the Swedish home, the um, like initial, I think you could very much uh, definitively say that this was a move to the right on behalf of the party, um, but a move to saying that um, like for now we are going to uh, build a welfare state that will take care of people, we're going to try to get everyone into work uh, in decent unionized jobs, we're going to uh, try to like like do the things that we now associate with a more reformist socialism. They also did drop a lot of their policies of like sectoral nationalization uh, at the time. However, those did come back uh, during and after the war and, and some industries were nationalized in Sweden under the Social Democrats. Um, but that wasn't actually how the minor plan carried out. It came more out of the broader macroeconomic model than any sectoral um, approach to piecemeal nationalization in the sense that was done in the United Kingdom under the Labour Party where uh, strategic industries would be picked off by Labour governments and say, okay, uh, coal and steel will be nationalized, uh, the railways will be nationalized, the uh, sh shipbuilding industry uh, would be nationalized, Rolls-Royce would be nationalized. Um, so some things like that did happen in Sweden, uh, but the, unlike the Labour Party, which certainly the left of the Labour Party kind of thought that at some point we were going to nationalize the entire commanding heights of production and that uh, socialism would sort of come out of this, the way that Sweden took uh, towards having like a more broad uh, uh, socialization of the entire economy came more out of the Ren Meidner model and adjustments to how uh, that sort of management was happening. And to get into that, we need to talk a little bit more about uh, that model, which was adopted post-war. So Sweden, in this sort of move to the right of the party, uh, adopted a lot of ideas coming out of the Stockholm School of Economics, which um, was centered around the ideas of economists like Olin and Gunnar Myrdal, uh, an economist who at this time it is worth uh, saying was one of the people cited in uh, Brown versus Board of Education uh, for his landmark work on uh, race in America, um, a decision which uh, to this day has not been implemented and um, we still have disgusting segregation of our communities, um, just feel like it is important to center that in some sense and to talk about that. Uh, but Murdahl was uh, best known for essentially uh, coming up with something that was quite similar to Keynesianism before Keynes and actually putting, uh, and the social Democrats actually put it into practice in a great sense during uh, the 1930s. Sweden, for that reason, uh, didn't have the same extent of social collapse and depression um, that some other countries did. There wasn't the, the Roosevelt depression. Um, but coming out of the war, um, there was a sense that this wasn't really enough anymore. Like many other countries, um, Sweden was neutral during the war, but its economy was heavily impacted by it and 
uh, there were very, very strong government controls over things, mostly as an effort to continue to main, maintain Sweden's neutrality. Um, and uh, so there was a lot of planning introduced into the economy. And as happened with most of the countries on the Allied side that introduced a lot of planning into their economy during the war, um, there was a sense that they didn't want to entirely abandon that and that uh, certainly the Social Democrats wanted to uh, use it to better introduce principles of their socialist values uh, and bake them into the wider economy. So um, the ren meidner model really emerged out of that. The, um, this is not the Meidner plan itself. This is the macroeconomic model that it was built out of uh, which is basically how uh, private firms and wages and prices and productivity, like how, how much stuff is being built, uh, what firms survive, like all of, all of that stuff that deals with like unemployment wages, conditions, bargaining, uh, collective bargaining, um, was restructured after the war uh, by the Social Democratic government and by the LO, the Trade Union Confederation of Blue Collar Workers that Meidner was the leading economist of, along with Gosta Wren, um, who was a, I would say, like marginally more moderate economist at the time, uh, but a very, very close friend of Meidner's and a a extremely close collaborator uh, throughout this entire period. Uh, the LO, uh, this trade union confederation, had a phenomenal amount of power and influence within the Social Democratic Party. And what the they very much viewed the Social Democratic Party as being the political wing of their union federation that would imp like implement policies that were, that were uh, debated and decided on by the workers in their organization that then the politicians would go out and follow them. And while that, that didn't always happen, that happened a lot of the time. So Meidner and Wren were in a phenomenally influential position to influence this union confederation that would then uh, instruct or certainly at least get a very, very uh, influential hearing with the political leaders of the day. Um, so Meidner and Wren developed this economic model which was implemented, which was centered around a very like pro-labor um, approach to economic management. Um, and the way that this was done was through the application of uh, sort of some of the principles of trade unionism uh, to macroeconomic management. So unions generally uh, want workers doing the same job in different firms and in different places to be paid the same amount of money, uh, but they want it generally to happen through the lifting up of people closer to the bottom rather than by squeezing down people at the top. Um, they want negotiations uh, to, like they want the unions to have value in negotiations. So they are skeptical of some of the corporatist bargaining practices where unions are made responsible for wage restraint, uh, by which I mean uh, making less demands than they could achieve uh, in order to keep things like inflation down or to prevent political conflict. And they want uh, to generally have workers advancing in their wages, in their conditions, in their standards of living, um, along with the growth of productivity in the economy. They want that sort of general uh, bargain of uh, if capitalists are making additional money, then workers should be getting as much or more additional money uh, as a proportion of their wages, generally a larger 
share of the pie should be going to workers than before, even as it expands. So the way that this was implemented in Sweden um, was that a centralized wage bargaining between unions and employers uh, began to happen, uh, initially on a sector level and then on a, a nationwide level between the LO and the Swedish Employers Federation. Uh, these negotiations would set standards across the entire economy. Um, they would set uh, minimum wages. A favorite thing that uh, libertarians do is say that uh, Nordic countries don't have a minimum wage, which is a complete lie because uh, minimum wages in almost every, if not every sector uh, throughout the periods of these great growths and to a large extent still today are just set by collective bargaining agreements across entire sectors or across the entire economy at this point in Swedish history. Um, so um, so this, this would happen and generally every year a very sizable wage increase would be guaranteed and especially to workers at the bottom end of wage scales. So if you are a worker in a northern Swedish town who was being paid less for a uh, steel working job doing the same role uh, because there were regional variations, you would be getting a much larger wage increase than someone who's at the very top of the scale. Um, the unions would still have the ability to be very militant in their demands, but they would have to make them across the wider economy. And the reason for them making them across the entire economy is so that inflation, the prices going up as a result of people having more purchasing power, um, could be controlled then easier by the government through its uh, tax policies and through the central bank. Um, this meant that unions could have a huge amount of bargaining power, they could be very militant in negotiations, uh, while also allowing the government to prevent wage price spirals. And uh, the Swedish government also implemented uh, some price control policies, things like uh, national rent control law, um, but largely, um, it allowed for standards of living to progressively increase quite quickly for Swedish workers. Um, so the upshot of this is that A, a lot of firms failed at the bottom uh, and their workers would very quickly uh, be absorbed into a very generous social benefit system and uh, helped with retrading and uh, matching programs into jobs very fast. Sweden had incredibly low unemployment during this period, usually between two and three percent, uh, which is basically unheard of. Um, but at the top, and this is where we get to uh, the real sort of influences of the Meidner plan, uh, Swedish workers um, had, uh, in the very top firms, would be asked to make uh, a little bit less in terms of their wage demands um, in order to have this across the board compression of wages. Um, this meant that firms at the very top became extremely profitable. So if you have the most productive for, of auto man manufacturer in the country and its workers are only asking for two or three percent wage increases every year in order that ones at the bottom of the scale could be asking for 10 or 11 percent increases every year and it was a incredibly rapid progression of people at the bottom as the social democratic period in sweden not only saw the massive expansion of the welfare state but also a gigantic rise in living standards uh, for the very poorest and for the industrial uh, low-income working class. Uh, but at the top, people's uh, incomes weren't rising that quickly. And they also felt that the beneficiaries of their low wage increases were going to a very small and concentrated capitalist class. 
the leader of the Swedish Communist Party wrote a book called The 14 Families, which was about this, these 14 families in Sweden who owned and controlled a huge proportion of the country's major, uh, uh, major industrial uh, production firms. Um, and there was a lot of anger about this. Uh, so around the turn of the 70s, you started seeing a lot of wildcat strikes, a lot of people going against uh, the policy of the LO because they felt that it was just uh, unfair and unequitable uh, that uh, they would be asked to make such small uh, demands, even though their firms were making such immense profits. And this was hugely concerning to the LO who felt that not only were they uh, like losing control of the workers, and there's some of the standard like uh, union uh, skepticism of like rank and file led uh, strikes, but the impact of it was not really, uh, uh, was not like primarily uh, conservatizing response, but rather uh, union recognizing that there was something that needed to be done. And as I said, the social democratic movement at the time still had this socialist horizon. And many, many people started to think that now is the time for a lot more democracy in the economy. Now is the time for a lot more worker ownership and control over the economy. And uh, that the LO should do something about this. And what they did was they got Meidner to uh, investigate into uh, some basic issues in the Swedish economy, how to deal with the problem of excess profits at the high productivity firms, uh, how to extend uh, <clears throat> uh, economic democracy throughout the economy. And a, a report was produced uh, by the Meidner group, which was composed of Rudolf Meidner himself, um, Anna Hedborg, who I believe is still alive, uh, and uh, Gunnar Fond. And the, the three of them uh, produced this report to the LO, which I think marks like one of Europe's uh, sort of like the crowning intellectual achievements of uh, the left wing of social democracy, along with uh, say Tony Benn's alternative economic strategy and the common program of uh, the Socialist Party and the Communist Party in France. Um, and like all of those documents, which got to different stages of uh, Benn's dying in cabinet and the common program in France dying after uh, the capital strike and the turn to austerity of Mitterrand, um, the minor plan, I would say, came somewhere in the middle, but closer to the French side. Uh, it lasted for longer in the way that it was eventually implemented, but we'll get to that. But it was massively watered down by the time it got in. Got in. But in its initial form, what the report proposed was immensely transformational. Um, Meidner, the Meidner group proposed that uh, for all firms in Sweden with uh, more than, they suggested a number, somewhere between 50 and 100 workers, um, on an annual basis, 20% of their profits um, uh, before taxes, so a larger percent than that of their post-tax profits, uh, would be um, uh, given to a fund that would be controlled by the union in that sector. So there would be a shipbuilder's wage earner fund, and there would be a um, railroad, or that's, no, I don't know, uh, uh, auto manufacturer's uh, wage earner fund. And uh, the 
And over time, uh, Meitner estimated that this would result over a period of about uh, 20 to 50 years for most firms in the economy. Some would go faster than that, some would go slower than that, but the majority of firms uh, would be brought into majority ownership by these worker funds. Um, the reality of this, as I assess it, <clears throat> may have actually been even quicker than this. The um, Where I sort of, in, in my personal politics, kind of break from uh, what the uh, left social democrats at this time believed would happen is that I think that once you set yourself on a path towards a general socialization of the economy, uh, there it will never go at the pace that you actually set it out at. So Meidner would have suggested that this would happen over the course of 25 years. The reality is that once business uh, like engaged in the inevitable attempt to capital strike to pull investment after they attempted to politically defeat it, if it had been fully successful throughout all of those things, it is extremely likely that the process would have been either massively sped up or maybe just at some point completed all at once. But what it did was it brought this sort of technical idea of um, like we could over a period of time uh, socialize not just strategic sectors, not just uh, build a welfare state, but that the broad mass of the economy uh, would be controlled by workers through their unions. Um, now, the funds themselves, and I, maybe we bring up the um, uh, chart there if we haven't already. I can't see uh, what you're all seeing. Um, but the funds themselves uh, would be uh, created in each sector. Uh, they would be um, responsible for uh, appointing directors in each firm with their uh, voting power. Uh, Sweden had passed a co-determination law in the 1970s, so workers would, in each firm, elect themselves or their, through their union local in their, uh, on their shop floor, would uh, choose one third of the board of directors and then the uh, sector fund would appoint the rest at the point that they had the voting power to do so. Um, the profits from those companies that were accrued in the uh, sector wage earner funds um, would then be um, administered to provide uh, really capacity building for a socialist economy at first. So Meitner, uh, who was himself a uh, sort of heterodox Marxist, um, didn't really want to get too far into the cookshops of the future as Marx described it, really only wanted to sort of lay out the uh, sort of next few decades of like what, sh what should be done. Uh, and what Meitner thought was really, really important was that workers would be uh, provided with uh, trade union and administration uh, education, uh, that there would be like funds for uh, research, that technical expertise would be provided for unions to best manage the companies, and generally that um, the funds would enable the trade union movement uh, to take on a much more effective role in the micro uh, management and the macro management of the Swedish economy. Um, so there is not a massive element of direct redistribution in how Meitner initially conceived this. The, uh, Sanders' proposal that came out last year and the uh, John McDonald proposal incorporated some form of dividend. 
I'll talk about those a little bit later, but in Meitner's original proposal for this, uh, it's important to note that the, the primary purpose of any uh, money that would be extracted from these companies by the funds would be to uh, be reinvested back in the infrastructure of the trade union movement, of the education of the workers and what it's ne is necessary to run an economy. Um, and I recognize that I'm going a little bit over time here, but I'll try to finish up in the next five minutes. Um, <clears throat> so this uh, plan was laid out in 1973. Was it uh, adopted fully by the Social Democratic Party uh, for its election campaign in 1975? Now by this point, uh, Sweden had been governed by the Social Democrats for a very, very long time, and it, the, they had only just won the last election uh, by a tiny margin. Um, and they actually had the same number of, of seats, but uh, they had control of the upper house, so they got to st stay in government. Um, and uh, in the 75 election, they lost, or the 76 election, I think. I, I, it, no, it is the 76 election. Um, and uh, then they also lost the election after that. Now, uh, there, were, there were huge mobilizations against the Meidner plan by the Swedish Employers Federation, who viewed it as the inevitable death of free enterprise and uh, the, like a gigantic threat to capitalism in Sweden. And they brought in uh, people from pop culture. Uh, ABBA uh, was an opponent of the minor plan. A uh, very regrettable thing for a person like myself who quite likes their music. Um, but um, ABBA nonetheless um, the Meidner plan did remain policy of the LO and of the Social Democratic Party uh, throughout these elections and maintained so even after they had lost these two elections. However, behind the scenes, the policy was being gradually compromised. Um, so the broader aspirations of the socialization of the economy under uh, like union and workers control and the democratization of the firm um, were emphasized less and less in the public messaging and the excess profits issue, the uh, issue of, of uh, firms at the top of the scale uh, giving too much of their profit share to capitalists and like the small concentration of owners and workers getting too small a uh, uh, benefit in terms of their annual wage increases uh, became much more central to the operation of the policy. And the result of this was that the, that the original Meidner report was rewritten to take out many of the most transformative elements. Uh, it uh, only, so instead of an automatic transfer of equity of share of voting shares in the company of 20 percent of profits every year instead an excess profits tax was imposed in cash that would be given to funds that would be run by the unions not in each sector but in each region um and those uh funds would be empowered to buy stock in companies, uh, largely on the stock market, um, uh, with the money that they receive for those purchases from the excess profits tax. Uh, so it, instead of the automatic socialization of the Swedish economy, it became much more a, uh, like workers now get a big pool of money to buy shares and companies with. And the, I, the idea was that they could coordinate uh, with each other to have control over a company. Uh, there were uh, four regular funds and a, a workers' pension fund that operated in much the same way, in a similar way, uh, that could together coordinate their 
um, purchases. They were capped in the amount of shares they could own in each company. But together, they could own a bare majority, 51% at maximum. So they, they, uh, there was an idea that at some point in the long distant future, um, th some companies could be controlled by these worker funds still. But in reality, it never happened. Uh, there was very, very little um, uh, prospect, nor was there very little belief among the unions that they were going to socialize the economy using the compromise method. Meidner hated it. He called it a pitiful rash um, and railed against the weakness and uh, compromising of the social democratic government at the time. Um, on the right of the party, uh, the new finance minister, Kjell Olaf Felt, uh, also hated them, but for more capitalist reasons. A felt was a part of this new um, neoliberal social democratic tendency and very much did not attempt to uh, make the funds work or to strengthen them or to sort of press the advantage any further. Um, so the funds did eventually accumulate about 8% of the value of the Swedish stock market, so no small amount of money. Uh, by the time that the Social Democrats were voted out in the early 1990s, at which point what funds did exist were privatized and the money was used to fund a series of research institutes, which are, were extremely successful, but had very little uh, potential in terms of creating socialism or democratizing the economy or even reducing economic inequality. They were just good research institutions. Um, so... In the end, the Meidner plan was a political failure. It became quite unpopular, especially among the Swedish middle classes, um, became viewed as a sort of symbol of the over uh, ambition of the Social Democrats and gradually sort of got compromised into something that was too weak to really uh, provide the goods and the benefits to workers that could potentially uh, see it through. Uh, I think that a lot of this had to do with uh, the general crisis of social democracy uh, and the fact that by the point that the Social Democratic Party got back into office, uh, the tides had turned away from the early 1970s where um, the uh, Social Democrats and the LO had were coming off a very long stretch of uh, highly successful and highly um, popular economic policies and were proposing this as their next step, but were voted out largely due to voter fatigue of the people just wanted to change. Um, and uh, then when they were attempted to be implemented, it wasn't with that momentum, it wasn't with that, um, record behind them that uh, gave them the ambition to really see it through. I think there's a possibility that um, something like this uh, could have been implemented. It is like most attempts at creating socialism, a long shot. Uh, but I think that um, it would have created a ruptural moment, uh, like a moment where it was sort of do or die uh, if this got passed in its original form, if it was going for a while, if business realized that uh, it was going to either strike back or um, to uh, fade away, there would have been a moment where the Social Democrats would have had to choose socialism or uh, total retreat. And I think that under Palm in the mid-1970s, there was a real, real chance that they could have actually uh, opted for uh, sticking it out and fully socializing the economy. This was a government that was, after all, uh, funding uh, liberation movements uh, across Africa and Latin America, and uh, who had surprisingly, uh, to many sort of online leftists today, a very, very positive relationship existed between the Swedish Social Democrats and Fidel Castro. Um, so I, I'll wrap up here by saying, I, I didn't get a chance to talk a huge amount about the um, sort of mo more modern proposals, the McDonnell and Sanders one. So if someone wants to ask me a question about those, I'd be happy to answer it, but I'll 
give you back to Baskar here uh, and say that one of the roads not taken uh, and one that I think still has a lot of relevance to our time. Well, that's great, Peter. Thanks a lot for uh, for that presentation. Uh, for everyone watching, I went so far I, over. No, no, that's fine. That's fine. Yeah. I mean, there was a lot of ground to cover. Yeah. Uh, and I'll jump right into the the questions so we don't use up more time. But for everyone watching, just press like, press subscribe. If you have some questions, put them in the chat. Try to get through as many as possible. Um, I guess let me start with a question that's a, that's about how where on the scale is the binder plan when it comes to being a pragmatic plan and being an ideological plan. So obviously there is the pragmatic need to contain excess profits. Yeah. So Swedish capitalists are accumulating excess profits. It's a product not of their power, workers' power at the shop floor, but in part because of this um, um, centralized wage bargaining, which mm -hmm. enables some firms at the top to accumulate excess profits in the past that was fine, that was the model working because they were reinvesting that excess profits into production. But eventually, as soon as the market gets a little bit iffy and workers start getting more rebellious at work, um, Swedish capitalists start withholding investment yeah. or even internationalizing and bringing, put, using more of the capital for dividends or, or just not expanding, not productively expanding. So there's that pragmatic push, but then there's a lot of people I think underestimate the ideological aspect. So uh, there's a great interview with uh, Meidner and the Socialist Register, I believe with Leo Panich yeah, in maybe brilliant. 1984, where he says, he mentions one scene that when it was passed, of course, they sang the Internationale. Yeah. But right before they sang the Internationale when it was passed, they um, actually made the plan um, cover more firms. So instead of just firms yeah. like over, 100 or 200 members uh it was like under 50 it was like yeah. 50 was a cutoff or something like that so so to what extent was it pragmatic and ideological and also like minor kind of himself of course an ardent socialist an ideologue uh like us he kind of rude that um that change and thought that maybe it, it commanded a a broader segment of the population yeah. kind of uh, to become more resistance to the plan but let's just start with the first question Prag pragmatism versus ideology where do you so I think that um, Meidner was very much a socialist in the sense that we would still talk about being a socialist today. Meidner um, in absolutely no way uh, believed that capitalism is good or should be just reformed. He wanted to have a socialist economy. Um, he thought strategically though. And Meidner's, and he talks about this not just in the Socialist Register interview, but also in the book that he wrote about this that's been translated into English, um, that uh, demands which were very common at the time to extend this not just to workers over a certain firm size, uh, to, to work, uh, workers and firms with uh, that over a certain firm size. Um, he wanted instead to like limit it to firms over that size. Many workers and smaller firms didn't understand that. They wanted uh, to have a wage earner fund in their own firms and to have it socialized and brought under the control of their unions as they probably should have wanted and probably would have been desirable in the long run. But Meidner was very, very conscious that there are a lot more small business people a lot more people who know small business people, a lot more people who have warm feelings about them than there are larger business people. And that by reducing the firm size threshold, um, it would exponentially, the further down the totem pole you go, it would ex exponentially uh, increase the amount of people uh, who had a personal stake in having their ownership taken away. And um, Meidner was attempted to calibrate where to set the line in such a way that uh, this uh, backlash force would be like, able to be overcome, but that the policy would still cover as many people as possible. Uh, and I think that that is very much what Meidner is about. And what honestly how I tend to approach socialist policymaking is to 
attempt to find the, to take your ideology and attempt to get to your ideology and how you would like things to be done, uh, but to be strategic about uh, how a reasonable, like a, a, a committed socialist government uh, could get something implemented and could potentially uh, uh, actually um, have this happen rather than having the most ambitious thing possible down on paper. Uh, this is right. obviously um, something that mo mostly applies to like a country that is an electoral democracy. So you see this kind of thinking in uh, pink tide governments as well, although in a very different stage of economic development. And you see these things like these considerations in a lot of um, uh, but, but, but gen, yeah. There, so yeah, obviously, like, you know. So, I, so I, 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 what I'm saying is that I, I think that Miner was ideological, but I think that the compromises that he made were largely motivated by his ideology. But the wage earner fund we can't just see, though, yeah. as social democracy trying to solve a problem just because this is the problem. In other words, it took no. the agency of people who had this ideology, it took the LO. Absolutely, yes. Okay, okay, yeah, yeah, I, okay. So uh, the wage earner fund, as it was adopted, as it was brought out of this trade union movement, and Meidner was a economist for the trade union movement. He was accountable to it. And he was uh, always thought of himself as being the like economic voice of that movement. Um, uh, the people demanded this, demanded a greater uh, say and more democracy in the economy. And the original version of the proposal for that reason was a lot more ambitious than would have been necessary to solve the narrow economic um, issue in the red minor model um like that patch was uh fixed essentially by the compromised version um it wasn't uh something that you absolutely need to socialize the economy to solve it was a useful sort of pretextual or like academic justification that one could make for this to um like certain people, there was a lot of attempts to bring on some of the more moderate, like petty bourgeois parties into uh, some sort of coalition for this. And this was a big outreach to them. The Social Liberal Party did engage in talks about this for quite a while. And their leader was in favor of some version of it at one point, although a much less ambitious version of it. Um, so, this became over time, especially as um, the social democrats were out of office and more focused on like getting back into power and making the compromises that are needed to do that, uh, more and more the one thing that they were really, really trying to do with it. Uh, so, so the mass mobilization, the mass politics that created it uh, deteriorated to the extent that a lot of workers couldn't really explain what they wanted out of it, even though they had in the past, and there had been a really strong, uh, especially among like um, the shop steward level and people who were like really actively involved in their unions, a huge but it is, for you. Would it be right to say that the LO rank and file was more invested than the SAP rank and file? Obviously there's a lot of overlap between the two, but should we, like, because well, there's a there's one question in the comments and Mike that yeah. that asked. Well, uh, the questioner is, is under the assumption, uh, maybe maybe you know better that the uh, one the Communist Party, I guess by now the left party, and the um, left wing of the SAP even were not particularly thrilled by the migrant plan or were not that invested. Do you have do you have a sense of, of where, what the yes. idea was for? So I'm not hugely aware of the intra-SAP discussion over this. Meidner was on the left wing of the SAP himself and um, was definitely considered to be um, and had stuck, staked out a more left wing position than the party leadership on a number of occasions. The Communist Party were very skeptical of this. 
um, mostly because they wanted a uh, like much broader and much faster like nationalize the top industries approach yeah, to things. Um, and um, I, I like I'm not a I don't have a huge amount of knowledge of how that debate played out or exactly what their objections were to it. Um, the SAP's uh, membership were generally in favor, but um, especially as the sort of debates about this got more and more technical, kind of disengaged from them uh, to the extent that when felt uh, like really started launching attacks on uh, like parts of the proposal, there wasn't a huge amount to defend it. The LO did remain sort of pretty staunchly in favor of it the whole way through, but it again uh, was not like the only thing that people would, would be talking about during the election in the way that you might think they are if you're having an election that technically has socialization of the economy. Yeah, I, th I think in 76, the debate over nuclear power and other things yeah. actually figured figured more, more yeah. um, largely. But I guess um, one thing that's worth noting is that the resistance to the migrant plan didn't just come about from just the elite that was going to be expropriated. Yeah. Uh, it was a massive propaganda campaign launched by the uh, SAF, the Employers Federation in Sweden, and the largest protest to date, I think, in sheer numbers, almost like a hundred thousand people in the streets. I think it was 1981 or something like that. Uh, were were protesting um, a variant of the of the minder minder plan. Um, yes. And so, so, so it's you know obviously like the the battle for public consciousness was was lost at that point, right. and that only made it easier once Palma came back into power. Uh, maybe 82 or something yes. um, in, in, until his death in, in 86, uh, February 86, that, um, you know, to, to backtrack away with this and to implement only a watered down uh, form. Yeah. I, want, I want to get some of the wider. So on the question of worker control at the point of production, what mm -hmm. did the proponents of the MITRE plan have to say about that? So obviously they had a conception of they wanted democratic unions and but they were aware of the sectoral interests. Sorry, sectoral in the in the other sense. You know, the narrow interests of just a group of workers at the point of production, and that's why they tried to band together the different um, workers together to bargain in unison through these um, through sectoral uh, bargaining yeah. or centralized uh, bargaining. Um, so, did they have a vision? of worker ownership of their own firms, or was this no. only meant to be ownership through these uh, sector-based um, uh, worker owner uh, funds? And was there, so, so in other words, the, the conversation about worker democracy is a bit different than the one we have in the US today, which yeah. is more centered in kind of a worker owners, cooperatives and whatnot. I don't even mean to denigrate that because I advocate something kind of similar. In, in, yeah. in my so I think that, um, like this is a really important question at the point that you get to where minor and the LO and um, like when you get to a point where this is something that realistically looks like it's going to happen at some point in the future. Um, the debate that happened in the US and the UK over this was really more like, at, at least as, as I conceptualize it, more just about introducing the idea that it is possible to have uh, like worker ownership and control throughout the economy, like and to like dispel the idea that socialism, as we are talking about it in some of these like resurgent left movements, uh, only means bringing back the welfare state a bit and maybe nationalizing a few utility companies. So like it was important in the sense of. Um, like less so in the details of that and more in the sense of making sure that the ambition is there to have a more thoroughgoing attack on uh, capitalism per se, rather than just uh, the worst sort of neoliberal aspects of it. That being said, you're totally right. Uh, Meidner, uh, the Meidner plan did not have uh, worker ownership of individual firms at all. Uh, there was, through the co-determination law and through a range of other laws, 
provisions for workers to have some control over their companies in terms of appointing uh, ombudsmen, of having like collective bargaining within the boundaries of the agreement. So um, the there were things that could be class, negotiated. Class ownership in a way. Class Not ownership rather than firm ownership. And um, yeah, the- There's all some problems. Like for instance, let's say me and you are working at a very capital intensive firm. You know, yes. just by virtue of that choice, we all of a sudden end up with millions of dollars a year in, for our labor, whereas a worker working in another company that mm -hmm. in the aggregate is just as prof profitable, but that's, you know, that employs yeah. a thousand people instead of six, you know, uh, there's certain injustices that could come about from just having firm owners and not having other layers of redistribution. Yeah. So there are, as, as you're well aware, some attempts to deal with this problem, uh, David Schweikart has the um, like essentially renting capital tax that would be paid out and redistributed to ensure that workers wouldn't get a bigger benefit from being in a capital intensive firm than a labor intensive one. But yeah, the minor plan solved this more through having did have some of that in terms of uh, the most capital intensive industries would pay something out to a clearing fund, uh, but. In a, in a sector level, um, the ownership would be centralized in a union that, uh, a union fund that would be- And, and the profits would be taxed under. anyway and directed yeah. to a generous welfare state and people would be moving around between jobs and sectors yes. to act the labor market policies and what, whatever. But, yeah. but one question I did want to get to was this question of of internationalism. So obviously there's competing impulses within the Marxist tradition. Of course, we are all internationalists, but there's a tendency that says, okay, we deal with our own national bourgeoisies, you know, first. And if we can expropriate them in Sweden, yeah. you know, it could actually work. Like one of the lessons of the Soviet Union, it wasn't a very good system, but it is, you know, socialism in one country does, does work. It is you know, not an impossibility. Um, it's not, obviously I'm not saying the Soviet Union was a good version of, of socialism, but you know, it was, it was a functioning, um, you know, society that didn't entail the end of the entire world market in other, in other countries. So is your perspective just kind of, we, we pursue in our national context is while participating in international solidarity efforts and, and whatnot, the expropriation of our national bourgeoisies, uh, then we hope to, in solidarity with other countries in the process of this effort, establish relationships and, 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 and things like that. So is it not an issue that, uh, so, so there's that one ideological like nationalism versus okay. internationalism perspective, but then there's the other question of the pragmatic factor. Well, how do we prevent um, capital from, from fleeing and going to countries that are not undergoing this kind of revolutionary uh, turmoil? Yeah, so this is a really, really important question. And it also kind of gets to one of the reasons why um, the model that was implemented was so unambitious. Because um, between the initial adoption of the report and the implementation in watered down form, you had the breakdown of the Bretton Woods system and the chain and the development of floating currencies, uh, which very, which prefigured and like quickly led to uh, the breakdown of capital controls between countries. Uh, the approach that I have to establishing socialism is I would say that internationalism is extremely important and the cooperation between progressive countries uh, that are uh, attempting to have socialist or socialistic projects is fundamentally important. Um, and I would say that certainly what, like one of the uh, best things about the Soviet Union was that it generally did support workers' struggles in a lot of developing countries. Um, obviously some re very repressive aspects of the society set to the side there. Um, but I think that it is generally right to say that it is unlikely that socialism on a full international scale uh, will be created through an immediate and total global revolution that will sweep away all the bourgeoisie of the entire world all at once. And I also don't think that the 
um, approach of like very incrementally attempting to slightly pull on international institutions in the right direction, even when they are directly and explicitly set up to prevent socialization of the economy is a viable alternative to that. Uh, Meidner, like myself, was a ferocious critic of the European integration project and did believe that it was being done largely to shore up and prevent things like the Meidner plan and things like the uh, advance of labor from continuing. So Meidner was no fan of the uh, Jacques Delors uh, approach to retreating from uh, national level attempts at building uh, socialist institutions and uh, then uh, attempting to build a very, very bare bones like social framework at European level. He thought that this was basically just like the sprinkling on a pile of largely like restrictive neoliberal rules that would, and I think he was correct about this, uh, largely prevent uh, any attempts at uh, national level efforts. So I think that internationalism is crucial, but that it will happen through like inter between uh, a lot of projects which take place and occur within the terrain of uh, the polities which already exist right now, which are at the moment states. Um, states like, in, the, in the contest between workers and capitalists within, within states. But that... And also between states, uh, you know, there's a, imperialist global system, capital is international, but the states are national. So you can take state power in one state, capital will attempt to uh, stop you both within it and also will attempt to flee out of it. Um, and other nations which are opposed to socialism will attempt to undermine and destroy your project from without. Um, so it is like internationalism is ex ex exceptionally important, both between movements and between governments that are attempting these sort of projects um, to attempt to deal with that international dimension of capital. Uh, but it's not enough to say that uh, just because our socialism must be international, that all of our actions uh, must totally disregard the terrain of struggle that is the state. Um, yeah, used to just dismiss any struggle. What, what would Corbyn do? It's just old Benism. It doesn't yeah. take into account that we're living in a new European reality. It's kind of a self, uh, self-defeating um, um, and defeatist uh, notion. But I, I want I want to end with one one question. Um, I'm sorry if I didn't get to your, your your question. Ali and some others have some some good questions to to get to. But I want to end with looking at the plan that came out of John McDonald's office um, when uh, Corbyn was the uh, labor leader. Uh, I wanna talk about the Bernie Sanders plan. Can you describe them? Can you describe the genesis and inspiration behind them? Um, is this a demand that, that you think we should, we should keep on the agenda, not just on the long term? We should foreground on the agenda. Obviously it should be somewhere in our agenda, even though it's slightly more abstract than our already popular core social democratic demands like for Medicare for all, for a Green New Deal, for um, you know affordable housing. And yeah. So I'm uh, much like my mayor, very practical about all of this stuff. And I think that it is, um, so the Corbyn and Sanders plans first to describe them. Uh, so we, we, ha we had this discussion about the firm versus sector level. Uh, both of these plans uh, I think largely out of the fact that people, uh, the, that union density is a lot lower in both, in both societies than it was in Sweden. It was very, very possible for Swedish workers to think of their union as a representative of the working class in that sector. Um, it is much, and there were employers associations that were being negotiated with, the sector was a very relevant uh, object of analysis for those people. The Corbyn and Sanders plans, uh, I think, correctly recognize that people do not, to the same extent, have that uh, resonance. And so instead attempted to do this on the firm level. So uh, they both proposed, instead of a percentage of profits, a percentage of the total equity of the company, I think 
uh, to make it a little bit more legible to people. So in the Corbin plan, it was 1% of equity a year. And they, in what I think was a generally uh, poor decision, uh, imposed a cap of 10% on uh, how much this would sort of ramp up to. I think largely because they were worried the business was going to freak out about it and that they were going to attack them really hard, which they were going to do anyway. Um, so uh, when we were talking to them about this, I, uh, and many others, I think, made this, made this point. Um, and I think that they, you know, they, they had legitimate concerns about, uh, like, oh, this is only intensified even further. Uh, some people are talking to us. Uh, I think that realistically, though, uh, like if this had been brought in, I think that Corbyn would have actually legislated for it. Um, and if coming out of one or two terms in Parliament, this had become a popular institution in people's lives, um, it would have uh, really uh, created pressure to have these things take on more of a role, potentially to have more sectoral collaboration between them as people, uh, or to have some sort of like Schweikart, like capital rent tax. There was a 500 pound cap on the dividends that came out of them, which um, was uh, important for having something to address that, but it wasn't necessarily the optimal way of doing it. It was just a simple way of um, putting something on that issue into the proposal. Um, the, like, so it, I think if this had been implemented, that there would have been a big push, especially among the Labour Party, to uh, go further with it and to like work out some of the kinks along the way. In the United States, I think the Sanders plan was a lot more like putting down a marker. Um, so the Corbyn team and a lot of the people around them very much did want to really do this. And there were people, especially in McDonald's office, who thought of this as a very important part of their early term agenda. I think Sanders uh, did see it as important as like part of a uh, worker, a centerpiece, like big demand around their worker ownership policies and their a firm restructuring stuff. Uh, but I think it was very unlikely that it would have been a priority for the administration. And I think they would have been right to say that. I don't think that in the US political system as it was constituted at this moment, that it really is possible to go much further than saying that, yeah, this is a good thing that we'd like to do at a time when we don't have universal health care for everyone, that we have a massive housing crisis and stuff. I think that you have to do some of those social democratic demands first. Um, uh, like the British parliament is a lot easier to legislate through. Um, These social, social democratic demands should build yeah. class power and build the horizons of, of what's, what's, what's yes. possible. And I think that we yeah, shouldn't drop it from what we want, but it shouldn't be put to the very, very front. It should be something that uh, you know, we say, this is something that we do if we could implement our whole agenda, but what are your first five or 10 bills going to be? Medicare for all, Green New Deal, uh, Homes Guarantee, uh, like there's a lot of things that come before it, uh, in, like uh, amnesty for and citizenship for undocumented people. There's a lot of things that uh, communities that we want to build up the, the socialist constituency, the people that we want to outreach to, and just generally the working class in general, uh, unions need to be given more power immediately. Like we need to uh, pass a workplace democracy plan that I would say not just doubles as Bernie was wanting to do, but really get union density up as quick as possible um, and empowers them as quickly as possible before we can really have this fight. Um, I. I, uh, the legislative program of a British government, which has a majority in parliament, is very, very different from how I would imagine a Bernie Sanders administration would have gone. Um, but I would like to see something like this happen. Yeah, in it's Egypt. basically so, impossible. Yeah, the left wing of the possible. <laughs> um, so, so that was great. Um, thank you a lot. Uh, thanks a lot for it, uh, Peter. I think it's important that people take away from, from Peter's talk uh, the fact that 
you know, social democracy is an unstable uh, compromise. It's built in with these contradictions, but that doesn't mean that we don't pursue these social democratic demands because one, they're good for people. They help millions yeah. of people's lives. And I think that's a moral imperative of socialists. And two, in fact, far from being a separate road from the road to socialism, there is possibilities within social democracy, within the building up of working class power to create the kind of ruptural break that we need to get to a more radical socialism, which will help both better preserve those good gains, but also expand the horizon of what's, what's possible, create deeper and more democratic uh, demands about ownership itself and why in the world we actually need a capitalist class given how uh, immense um, the resources of the world is. But uh, thanks everyone for tuning in. Press like, press subscribe. Thanks again to Peter. Uh, I'm going to head out to the, the protest at Barclays. Uh, I hope everyone stays safe. Uh, maybe, don't, maybe don't stay at home this, this weekend, but you know, wear a mask or whatever. But um, All right. Take care, everyone. Bye. Thank mm -hmm. you.